thank you for um, just sharing your word, your presence, and your spirit with us. I pray, Father, that as we look at these particular passages of Scripture, the history of how the church began and how your spirit just moved through um, the land at that time, I pray, Father, that we would be both inspired and that we would be encouraged, Lord, that we have a part in what you're doing. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified as we reflect you on the earth. That's what you intended our church to do, is to be a reflection of you. And Lord, to be a, a, a wonderful place of your presence and of your peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, listen, guys, let's do a little bit of a refresher. And for those of you that are watching by Facebook, we're glad that you're watching with us all over the country. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of refresher of what we had been going through in the book of Acts. Now, the guy's name is Paul. Everybody say his name. Paul is the main character in our story. And Paul was at one time a religious leader in Jerusalem. He was a Pharisee. Um, his, I, I, you know, I always picture this, Paul's life song, since he was a religious man and a Pharisee, his theme song, uh, his life song was kind of like the theme song from Nacho Libre. You know, I am a very, very religious man, is, is what it was. Um, Paul ran around as a religious man enforcing religious rules to the point of imprisoning and murdering people for converting for following Jesus. So here is Paul, a religious man, that's how he started, a Pharisee, persecuting Christians because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, during Paul's hostile persecution, during the time that he is bringing the word in, the, in Acts as havoc against the church, when he's doing that, all of a sudden, the resurrected Christ appeared to him. And Jesus reached out to him. Now, Jesus is always reaching out to us. Can you say amen? No matter how angry, no matter how wrong, no matter how rebellious or hateful or combative we are, he is always reaching out to us with his unconditional, immeasurable, irresistible love. Amen. Yeah. Now, during that encounter, as Paul was, you know, persecuting the church and Jesus appeared to him, during that encounter, Paul, you, you know, he, he basically repented. He surrendered. And he became a Jesus follower. Isn't that awesome? I mean, Jesus' love is irresistible. He, he, you know, during that encounter with Jesus, he became a Jesus follower. And then a little later, Paul became a missionary. He began taking the story of Jesus and salvation to all of the Gentiles or all of the non-Jews everywhere. I mean, here was a man who was a hater of Christians, and he became a leader of Christians. Here's the statement. Everybody say it out loud. God makes all things new. Say it again. God makes all things new. <laughs> it's awesome. Here's the verses of Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, this is what the Bible says. God is saying this. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will take from you your hearts of stone and give you tender hearts of love for God. Isn't that awesome? God does that. God transforms our life. Later on, Paul explained the transformation like this. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, read it with me. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. <laughs> right? Listen, it's not restoration or rehabilitation. God does transformation. You know, God doesn't make you better. He makes you new. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. He doesn't make you better. He makes you new. He gives you a new spirit, a new family, a new appetite, a new purpose. Everybody say new. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, I'm brand new. Just look at me. I'm brand new. 
That's what he did to Paul. In that encounter, as Paul surrendered to him, God transformed his heart. Paul ended up becoming not just a Jesus follower, but a missionary, sharing Jesus' message of salvation everywhere. In fact, for 20 years, Paul traveled, preached, and taught Gentiles about Jesus. I mean, he, he crossed three continents. In fact, let's go ahead and look at the map and, and, tell, and show you where, where, what happened. Here is, is Israel and, and Jerusalem, and that's where Paul had originally encountered Christ, uh, actually on his way to Damascus, to Syria. He encountered Christ. Christ appeared to him. He surrendered, and he ended up becoming a Christian and taking the message of Jesus to Antioch, and the church started there. He started a church there. He went over to Tarsus. He went over to De a church started there. He went over to Lystra, preached Christ, and a church started there. He went to Iconium, preached Jesus, and a church started there. He went to Antioch and preached Jesus, and guess what? A church started there. But he didn't stop. He continued. He came all the way to Troas. At this point, he thought, well, this is the end of the road. What should I do? Well, he caught a ship, and he went all the way over to Philippi. He preached Jesus there. Guess what? A church started. He went over to Thessalonica. He went to Berea. He, he, in, in those places, guess what? A church started there. Then he went all the way to Athens. He went then to Corinth. And in Corinth, he stayed there and preached Jesus, Sin City, USA. And guess what? We're... Where sin abounds, grace does abound much more. And a church started in Corinth in that awesome guys. Then he came to the most evil city, the most occultish city in the world, a place called Ephesus. And he preached Jesus there in the midst of the occult. And guess what? Jesus prevailed and a church started there. Isn't that awesome, guys? It's beautiful. Look at your neighbor and say, it's beautiful. Now, at this point in the story, guys, Paul had been pastoring for two years in Ephesus, that last city. For two years, two and a half years, he's been there in that area of Turkey. He's gone to Syria. He's gone to Turkey. He's gone to Greece, preaching the gospel. And now, for two years, he's been in Ephesus, Turkey. And that's when he heard that the Christian church back in Jerusalem was starving. Everybody say, ah. Oh. I mean, where he first was persecuting the church, where the church had first started with all the apostles. I mean, 20 years later, he's preached the gospel everywhere, and then there in Ephesus, he finds out the church in Jerusalem was starving. The reason it was starving was there was persecution, obviously, against Christians in Jerusalem. And then there was prejudice against them. And then there was, it was followed, that, all that was followed by a famine in Jerusalem. I mean, guys, we know that when it rains, it pours. Can you say amen? We know that Satan throws punches in bunches, doesn't he? And that's what Jerusalem was going through. The Jerusalem Christians were taking a beating out there. And so Paul, in Ephesus, wanted to help. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a good thing. Paul wanted to help. Because the reason Paul wanted to help is because the Bible tells us Christians this. It tells us to what? Put your money where your mouth is. Is that really a scripture, Pastor Dion? No, but it's close. Let's read it. James chapter 2, verse 14. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll pray for you. And then walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup? Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Guys, the guy who wrote this particular verse was James, the brother of Jesus, and the church leader in Jerusalem. 
He had wrote this before this famine had taken place. I'm sure Paul had read this particular passage from James. And so he knew, hey, listen, they're going through some uh, trying times right now. They're starving out there. I want to help. I want to do more than just say, I'll pray for you, James. I want to do something, Paul said. Paul knew James' statement was true. Promising prayer isn't good enough if you have a little bit extra to share. I'm going to say it again. Promising prayer isn't good enough if you have a little extra to share. So don't be stingy. Don't be a tightwad. Don't be a colavudo. Don't be a scrooge. I mean, this guy here, I mean, he squeezes a nickel so tight, he makes Thomas Jefferson scream, you know? Don't be him. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be him. Look at your other neighbor and say, don't be him. You know, in London, there is a lodge, an inn, a hotel that's called Inn of St. George and the Dragon. All right? Let's say it out loud. It's called the what? The Inn of St. George and the Dragon. Well, one day a homeless man knocked on the door of the Inn of St. George and the Dragon. The landlady answered, and the homeless man said, C Could you give a poor man something to eat? No, said the woman, and slammed the door in his face. Well, the man knocked again, and she answered it again. And the man said, could I have a few words with George? You guys are going to get it. Because she's the dragon. Everybody say that loud. Don't be the dragon. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be the dragon. I have to wait for you to get it. Look at your neighbor again and say, don't be the dragon. In fact, the apostle Paul urged us like this. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Read it with me. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everybody, everyone, especially to those in the family of faith no matter of their race or political affiliation, no matter if they're for or against the wall or gun control. So Paul sent this particular message to all the churches. He had started. He said, hey guys, we can't not help here. We've got to do something, especially to those in the family of faith, even if we disagree with some of the ways they do things. He says, we've got to help. He asked all of the churches that he had started over that course of three continents, he asked them to gather offerings for the starving Christians in Jerusalem. And, and then he also asked them if they would bring, send a representative to carry those offerings into Israel. He said, hey, listen, this is my plan. I'm asking you guys to gather some offerings for the starving Christians. We'll meet at a certain place after you've gathered them, and we'll go together, all the representatives from each church, to present our gift to the Christians out there in, in Jerusalem. And so Acts 20 actually gives us uh, the passenger list of at least eight men that traveled with Paul to Israel, to Jerusalem. Together, Paul and those eight men arrived in Jerusalem, and they presented their gifts to James, who happened to be the brother of Jesus and the leader of the first church, and Peter and John and Matthew and Thomas and Philip. They got there, they presented their gifts. That's where we are in the story, so let's go ahead and read. Acts chapter 21, verse 18. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, everybody said out loud, they what? They glorified God. Isn't that exciting? 
So here are these representatives from all the churches in the Gentile world, and, you know, and they're coming with Paul, and they're bringing gifts to help the church in Jerusalem get back on its feet. It's, it, it's a beautiful picture. Paul was so proud of what God was doing among the Gentiles. Paul probably went through the room and asked his companions to, stay, to share their stories and their miracles. Stories that are just like ours. I mean, what's your story? What's your miracle? What, what has God done in your life? You know, there was an old song we used to sing when I was a kid in church. And they used to say, you know, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I was a, and then you know, people would fill in the blank, and Jesus set me free. So let me hear your story. What's your story? You were a what? A drug addict. A drug addict. What else? And Jesus set you free. What else? I was an alcoholic. I was angry. I was sick. I was depressed. I was lost. I was greedy. I was broken. I was but Jesus set me free. Can you say amen? I can't imagine those men, those men that were with Paul, those companions sharing their stories. Their freedom from addictions, their restored relationships, their reconciled marriages, their healed bodies, their in, the inspirational changes in their life, the, from anger to patience, from lying to honesty, from profanity to preacher, from sinner to saint. Can you say amen? I'm sure it's exciting. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. <laughs> That's enough to glorify God, right? Listen, don't be embarrassed of what you were. And don't just generalize, generalize it like, well, I was lost. I was a sinner. Now, you were much more than that. Define it and own it. Can you say amen? Because it's a testimony to the living God of his transformation power. Yeah. I'll get off that soapbox now. Let's move. I mean, guys, the room there was electric. It was filled with celebration, with worship, and with praise. It was exciting. But then the Jerusalem church leaders said, well, that's great in all, Paul, the work that you're doing. You know, praise the Lord, hallelujah. That's great in all. But what you need to know about Jerusalem is that the Wi-Fi is slow and the gossip is fast here. They said, we heard rumors. So in the middle of this, this exciting, wonderful experience where everybody's praising the Lord for the changes and the transformation, all of a sudden they said, well, <clears throat> Paul, we heard some rumors. Everybody said, what? Rumor. We heard some rumors through the grapevine about you, Paul, that you are teaching Jews to abandon Old Testament Bible laws. You are teaching Jews to abandon mandates, Bible mandates and Old Testament traditions. And everybody say, no. Let's read it. Chapter 21, verse 20. And they said to him, after, the, you know, brought, when the praise is breaking out, they're glorifying God. And they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? Everybody said, what? What? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Everybody say, ooh. 
All right, so let's kind of clarify some stuff. Before sending his son, Jesus, as Savior, God mandated certain laws and rules in the Old Testament. The old agreement. Everybody say it, but what? The old agreement. So before he sent his son, God mandated some rules and some laws in the Old Testament to maintain relationship with him. So before Jesus, he sent out the law, the regulations, and he said, hey, listen, this is what it's going to take to maintain a relationship with me. Circumcision, they're named circumcision, Sabbath, priesthood, temple, sacrifices, which the Jews took to the extreme and turned it into, turned those laws into, everybody said a lot of what? A religion. Say it again, a what? A religion. They turned it into a long list of rules. But then Jesus came and announced, Papa's got a brand new bag. All right? Jesus introduced a new covenant, a new testament, a new agreement for a relationship. You guys got that, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Say it again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I have come to supersede the old covenant to replace the Old Testament, to replace the Old Agreement. I am come for that. Isn't that awesome? Now, the New Testament book of Hebrews explains this so well, guys, even a caveman can understand it. The New Testament book of Hebrews reveals this. It reveals that Jesus is our temple, our Mecca, our sanctuary. Jesus is the place of God's presence, of God's pardon, of God's power. We don't need a man-made temple to experience God's presence, peace, or protection anymore. All right? That's what the book of Hebrews starts by saying. It also says that Jesus is our high priest. He is our mediator, our go-between. Men don't need priests or saints anymore. Jesus is also our once and for all sacrifice. Everybody said once and for all. He's our once and for all sacrifice. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We don't need sacrifice or penance anymore. Jesus is also our link to the family of God. Jesus said, to as many as believe and receive me, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. We don't need sacraments or circumcision anymore to be in the family of God. So here's the takeaway from Hebrews. Everybody say it out loud. Jesus is all I need. Say it again. Jesus is all I need. Here are some verses. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now, everybody, out of date and will soon disappear. You guys got that right? And then Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. Christ, everybody out loud, Christ ended the law so that everyone who believes in him may be right with God. You don't need the law to be right with God. Jesus makes us right with God. Everybody said, oh, Jesus is all I need. It's also best illustrated at Jesus' death on the cross. You remember that. 
Jesus was crucified. The cross was put in place. He was dying there. And then when he died, listen to what Matthew records in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50. It says, Then Jesus shouted out again and gave up his spirit. Read this part out loud with me. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split apart. If you've ever wondered about the significance of the torn veil in the temple, God was saying, I am done here. I am done with priests, with temples, with sacrifices, with religious barriers. My son Jesus is the new and living way. That's what, that's what God was saying. The Old Testament laws, traditions, rules, and religion are over. Their time has passed. Say it out loud. Their time has passed. You know, along with mullet haircuts, tie-dye t-shirts, eight-track tapes, and disco music. It, wave of goodbye. Go ahead. Wave goodbye. Oh, God. So are religious rules, regulations, and the law. <laughs> Dietary laws, sacrificial offerings, Sabbaths, are over. Jesus is all you need. Say, look at your neighbor and tell him that. Jesus is all you need. You know, trying to keep religious rules when you have Jesus is about as crazy as wasting dough on sugar-free cookies. Trying to keep religious rules when you have Jesus is about as senseless as an ashtray on a motorcycle. Now those were the facts. Paul had taught this in his neck of the woods. That's what they're actually accusing him of. Because well, it's true. Everybody say what? It's true. But religion dies hard in Israel. You've met people like that where religion dies hard, right? That was happening in Israel. The Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were still holding on to their religious views. And they would be offended if they saw Paul. Unless, everybody said what? Unless. Unless, unless they saw Paul keeping up with Jewish traditions. I mean, if they saw Paul and they know what he's been preaching, it's going to cause a riot. Unless, unless if they saw Paul keeping up with religious traditions. So James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, suggests that Paul sponsor three Jewish men fulfilling an Old Testament ritual law. Let's read it. Chapter 21, verse 23. Therefore, do what we tell you. Okay, because you know, these people are going to, you know, they're going to go ballistic when they see you. So he, therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. It's a religious vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are a lie. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So, here's what they're suggesting to Paul. All right then, listen, you know, they're going to be ballistic if they see you. So unless they see you fulfilling some Jewish rituals and rites. So here's what we got. We got these four guys who they've completed a vow. And basically they don't have the money to, you know, give their sacrifices and go through the whole ceremonial process at the temple. 
So it would be good if you joined them and paid their way. That would go a long way with the people. James' intention was to try and keep unity with the church. He was trying to keep unity between the new Christians who still had strong Old Testament views and keep unity with mature Christians who knew the Old Testament was over. That's what James was trying to do. Keep unity between the new Christians with their Old Testament views and also keep, keep them unified with those mature Christians who knew they were no longer under the law. Now within the church, there are believers. Within our church, there are believers who have very different views on religion, politics, and patriotism. I mean, is God on the blue side or the red side? Is God Catholic or Protestant? Is God on Kansas City side or San Francisco side? We all have strong opinions and convictions, don't we? As Christians, how should we treat those on the other side of the aisle? Are you ready? Are you ready? I'd love to tell you, but we're out of time. <laughs> Woo! We'll have to catch up next week. But here's a preview. You ready? Jesus' passion. Jesus, here's a preview of what we'll talk about next week. Jesus' passion was not religion politics, or patriotism. But, everybody said this was Jesus' passion. I'm going to say it again. Jesus' passion was not religion, politics, or patriotism. But, everybody said, people. Reaching them. Connecting with them. Saving them. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of tension this morning. Is that okay? Look at your neighbor and say, tension. What are your attitudes and actions towards those on the other side? Are they seeing from you compassion or contempt? Last verse of the morning. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Let's read it out loud together. Whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. That's okay. I don't expect for you to clap. It's kind of tense. Let's all stand. Father, we've gathered here this morning to hear from your word, to become more like Christ. I pray, Father, that we would be challenged this morning with living like Christ, becoming more like you. I pray, Father, that with that challenge, we won't leave it here this morning, but we'll take it out into the world with us, to work, to school, to whatever arena we go to. I pray, Father, that our Christian faith and people would be our real passion to reach them, to connect with them, and to help them know you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. Did you learn something this morning? Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't surrendered your life completely to Christ, 
Maybe you've been on the other side of Jesus and you've known that. And maybe Christians have been the reason you stayed on the other side. Jesus is reaching out to you. He's not judging. He's not condemning. He's not criticizing. He's reaching out to you to bring you into his family. And all he asks is that you reach out to him. That you recognize that you are apart from him and that you reach out. If you, that's you this morning, would you raise your hand and say, I'm reaching out to Jesus. I want to connect or reconnect with him. Beautiful. Because of your faith, let's pray out loud together. Father, I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I have ignored you, I have run from you, and I have fought you. But today, today I surrender. I repent for my sin and I turn to you. Wash me clean. Make me new. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. <laughs> well, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you're rededicating your life, there's going to be some leaders standing up here. And at the close of this next song, which I want you to sing along with them because it's, it's a prayer of salvation, this song. I love it. So, listen, before you leave, just come on up here as they're playing that song. Reach out to one of these leaders. Let them know you prayed with me. And they'll welcome you to God's family. <laughs> and you will feel the transformation. You will begin to experience the newness of life that only Jesus can bring. Religious can't get, religion can't give it to you. Baptism can't give it to you. You know, keeping a list, a list of rules can't give it to you. But the peace and the newness can only come from Jesus. So take advantage of it. Amen? For the rest of you that need prayer, that need healing, that just would like a, a, a shoulder to lean on, these folks have some wonderful strength, spiritual strength, to be able to share with you. So take advantage of that. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you this week, and be gracious to you, and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you, and may he establish all the works of your hands. I love you guys. We'll see you on Wednesday night.